Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, everyone on the line here. So today we're going to be talking about bidding to value. And it's kind of this, this overarching theme around incrementality on Amazon that we're going to be uh, hitting on over the next, you know, I'd say several months. And we, we've already done some assets around this, but this is going to be kind of an ongoing series. This is a big part of uh, when you think about measuring and, and working towards incrementality Amazon. Bidding to value is a is is a big part of this, and really excited to be joined by Kyle Barron, who's the head of sales engineering over here at Take a Metrics. And Kyle does a lot of both audit work and kind of just has has worked previously as an analyst looking at you know how brands should be thinking about growing their business and specifically where they may be falling down on the job a little bit when it comes to having been having bids commensurate with the value towards their specific business so there's a lot to go over here so before we get started just a quick uh housekeeping note uh first off if you have questions kind of during the course of the webinar you don't have to wait till the end of the presentation feel free to use the question box on the right hand side and we'll again get to as many of those questions as we can at the end of the webinar uh, as part of the q a session Additionally, we're recording this right now and we will give everyone uh, on the line here a recording of this webinar along with the full slide deck uh, within 24 hours following the conclusion of this presentation. So keep an eye out for that. Additionally, as part of that, we're gonna send along uh, a incrementality focused ebook that we produced uh, earlier, uh, just as kind of a, a good way to kind of have some additional material outside of what we cover in this presentation. So. With that, we can kind of talk just a uh, small bit about what Take a Metrics is and, and does for, for those who aren't familiar uh, on the next slide here. So Take a Metrics, we're a technology platform, but what we do is we have both a SaaS only product for folks that really want that level of control um, and, uh, uh, and expertise in their business that they already have it in-house. Additionally though, let's say you're a brand that wants that extra help with hands-on keyboard, we offer uh, expert analysts to kind of pair with our software uh, and really just help take that expertise to another level when it comes to both Amazon and we're one of only four uh, API partners uh, that can place your ads on walmart.com at scale. So here are some of the brands we work with uh, down here below and obviously you know, feel free to go to takemetrics.com to learn a little bit more. So with that, let's let's jump into the agenda here. So first, what we're gonna discuss is, let's just define incrementality on Amazon, why it's important, specifically really around in the context of bidding to value, right, like what we're talking about, and, and specifically, right, what, why is bidding to value important in the context of incrementality? These are kind of two, two very close concepts. Next is, ways brands on Amazon have missed the mark in the past. Where do you want to, sh what do you want to shy away from strategically to put your business in the best uh, position to bid to value and be able to address that consistently both across your product catalog and over time. Finally, we're going to talk through kind of st structuring campaigns so you can effectively bid to value. This is actually super important. Some of these basics are really extremely important kind of as you uh, want to do this over the long term getting the basics right matters and then finally we're just going to wrap up with examples of kind of the audits we've done and specifically kind of Kyle has, has led this effort over here at Techmetrics when it comes to bidding to value really how these audits look and how we structure them and just going over a couple of examples there and then at the end obviously get to all your questions uh, as we go so with that I wanted to pass it over to Kyle Thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to be here uh, to go over today's topic of bidding to value. So just to set the stage here, what we want to ultimately accomplish is use your marketing strategy, use uh, the way that you're bidding on individual keywords in order to drive the most incremental value. So sales that you're capturing that would not have happened organically. Uh, and that way you're increasing the sales on your items, uh, ultimately increasing maybe the bestseller rank, uh, the position that those products appear uh, on the search results page, uh, and ultimately cranking this flywheel effect 
of uh, more sales increases product visibility, which ultimately leads to more sales. So today, what we're going to be talking about is what marketing strategies can you employ in order to accomplish this goal of driving the most incremental value. So the core concept of what we're gonna be talking to, about today is value-based bidding. So how do we take every single keyword that you might be bidding on and make sure that the bid for that keyword is properly expressed given the value that you expect from that keyword? So what we're looking at is for a given keyword, how much is that worth to to your business? And, and that's not going to be the same depending on a lot of different factors. It's not going to be the same depending on the contents of the query, the, uh, the, the type of audience who is who's making that query. Um, the next part is going to be how to structure those campaigns so that you can align your business goals with tac uh, tactics within your advertising uh, ecosystem in order to translate this value-based bidding philosophy into action, into value, and ultimately into sales. And then once you've established that foundation, what kinds of metrics can you look at? What are the uh, what are the types of reports or what are the types of analyses that are going to help you iterate on that model? Just because you're setting up these, these campaigns according to, to the best practices and, and just because you've made these calculations once doesn't mean that the job is complete, doesn't mean that you've reached uh, the ultimate peak of, uh, of value because the ecosystem is constantly changing. There are going to be your competitors who are launching their new products. Um, you're going to be launching new products. So how do you make sure that you're on top of, uh, of everything with the right metrics, with the right reporting, and, and ultimately looking at your, uh, your account with the right lens to make um, uh, justified decisions for how to continue driving incremental value? So I mentioned that not every ad click on Amazon is worth the same amount to your business. So what does that really mean, right? There's, you have, you have clicks that are driving to the uh, consumers to your product detail pages. Uh, a click is a click, right? Um, actually, it's not. And there are a couple of different um, dimensions here that affect that value. So one example is where does this product rank organically for some of the uh, some of the keywords that it might appear for for example if the product has that first organic slot how much incremental value are you going to drive if it appears again in one of the top of search placements in sponsored products right there's not a lot of diversity in there and there's not not too much uh, distance between the value if you hadn't won that placement versus if you if you are winning that placement. Where is that product in its life cycle stage? Is it something that is just launching and therefore needs a lot of fuel to, uh, to get sales in order for it to appear more in organic results? Uh, or is it something that you're looking to phase out, something that is um, being sunsetted and therefore needs to be uh, needs to be moved out of your warehouse or is it something that is one of your mainstay products that you're looking to to drive the most profitability out of because it's it's at a comfortable stage in terms of its uh, its growth and in terms of how, how much in sales it's already doing uh, a big one is going to be the the targeting or keyword type so what are the actual contents of the keyword or of the search term that might affect the value one way or another? Are they putting a competitor brand in the, uh, in the search query? Are they including your brand in the search query? Those are the types of things that, that we wanna look at and, and make informed decisions on. Uh, and activity volume. 
So if you see really high conversion rate uh, on a given term, how much are you uh, are you valuing that, uh, and then adjusting your bids based on on those conversion rates, right? That that goes beyond just looking at ACOS or ROAS. Um, what what you want to do is say, okay, of the people who are reaching these product detail pages, uh, what's the propensity for those consumers to uh, to then convert? Uh, and all of these dimensions put together um, can affect how much you're willing to bid up or bid down uh, on a given keyword. Not every keyword is, is going to have the same exact value uh, given these, these different modifiers. So why does, why does keyword type matter? What's the, what are you ultimately trying to measure when, uh, when thinking about the different kinds of contents or different ways that you're targeting these, uh, these consumers. So branded keywords, if you have uh, a, a keyword or a search term that contains your brand or contains the, uh, the specific product line that you're, uh, that you're selling, these are consumers who already have exposure to your brand. Uh, these are consumers who are already aware. Uh, they might already know what, they, what they're what they looking for and they're just using Amazon to, uh, uh, to execute on that, um, on that purchase. They might be uh, repurchasing uh, an item that they buy regularly. Um, so uh, it's definitely important to make sure that you're defending your territory with, uh, with advertising. Uh, because other competitors might be bidding on uh, on your terms, and and defense is is the right way to think about it. Um, so when we're looking at pros versus cons, the the pro is that Amazon is also incentivized to to drive sales, and therefore will give you the advantage uh, on um, uh, on these branded keywords, uh, and therefore you can keep uh, you can keep a cost low. Um, and uh, and you don't need to uh, to overbid here just because you uh, you feel like you need to win every impression, right? And that's that's on the that's on the con side is that if you are winning all those impressions, how many of those sales that would have happened anyway had you not won it um, are you taking away from the organic side? So. Just because the ACOS looks good, just because the ROAS looks good, just because conversion rate looks good, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that you're driving incremental value because you might be winning that first slot in the sponsored products um, placement, and then the consumer converts through that click instead of clicking on the organic placement. So on the flip side, you can think of competitor keywords as an offensive strategy, right? So how can you take market share away from your competitors and drive consumers towards your products? So while your branded keywords, that's going to have a, a really high conversion rate and a really good ACoS, the competitor keywords, that's going to have a much lower conversion rate and it's going to have a much higher uh, ACoS or a lower ROAS. Um, so inherently, an incremental sale is when you're able to drive revenue from uh, from uh, a consumer shopping for uh, for a product that would not have purchased your product organically. And so, competitor keywords has the largest opportunity for driving these incremental sales because they might already be familiar with with a different brand. And if you're able to uh, convince this consumer that your product is better or you have a more competitive price, um, then you're able to drive a sale that would not have happened had that customer not seen that ad, whether it be on the search results page or whether it be on a product detail page. Um, and so that's something that you need to be aware of, right? You need to strike this balance between how how much can I invest in in competitor targeting, right? You don't want it to be all of your ad budget. Right, because then, then the uh, then the returns not going to be uh, ideal. You need a balance between all of these different uh, all of these different targeting types. 
And then the last bucket that, that we like to think of is, is category keywords. So 70% of Amazon searches are brand agnostic. And so how, how are you going to convince these consumers that your product is the one that they should ultimately convert on? Um, you know, there's, there's a right price for every keyword that you should be, that you should be bidding. Um, so how do you properly measure? How do you create uh, this value? And how, how are you getting in front of these consumers who are looking to buy a product in your category? How are you going to convince them that your product is, is the one that they should go with? So um, that, that's going to depend on the kind of performance that you're getting from a certain keyword. Um, that's going to depend on the conversion rate. Um, you know, there might be some category keywords that your products perform a lot better on, um, and therefore you should be willing to, uh, to bid up on them. Um, the, the con is that these are generally the, uh, higher volume search terms, uh, and therefore there's a lot of competition. And so with a lot of competition, there comes risk of overbidding, uh, or, you know, trying to win too many impressions. So again, it comes back down to what's the right price to bid uh, given these inputs, given these kinds of uh, metrics that we should be looking at. And and just to just to build on that with with some stats that uh, are drawn, this is directly actually from Amazon Retail Analytics and um, uh, their brand analytics page around. Uh, these are we these were looking we were looking at the top 10,000 terms across all of Amazon this was roughly a year ago but this this kind of trend normally is it, it stays relatively steady and we looked across categories and we specifically looked at okay how many of those terms were category or generic terms right where no brand was included let's say right white shoes uh, versus a branded term right which would be like Adidas white shoes for example and what you find is across every single category, there are more generic or category type terms uh, in the top 10,000 terms by, by search volume as opposed to branded terms. So, right, as, as Kyle mentioned, right, these are these category terms tend to be the most popular in a given vertical for obvious reasons, right? A consumer doesn't know necessarily what product they want or what brand they want, so they search for maybe just the, the product. Uh, and you see, right, for certain categories, it's even more dramatic, right, with like home and kitchen, where it's overwhelmingly more category terms. So this just kind of brings up the point that these are some of the terms that uh, are, on one hand, right, can drive the most value for you uh, and, and most volume when it comes to actually just number of conversions. But right there, they, these are the most popular and you're likely going to encounter probably the most competition on those type of terms. So these are the types of questions that you should be asking yourself when deciding what to set as a bid for a given keyword. So do you have a campaign structure that effectively allows you to measure the uh, the performance that you're getting, the return that you're getting, depending on these different keyword types? Um, do you have uh, not only dedicated campaigns for uh, for branded terms, for competitor terms, and for category terms, but do you also have that broken out across all of your products, right? Because you might have some products that perform really well for given keywords and some products that perform rather poorly for, for certain keywords. And so getting that uh, keyword product pair as granular as possible so that you can not only measure it, but ultimately make uh, inform decisions and uh, and iterate on that process. That all starts with the campaign structure. Um, so, on which portions of your product portfolio should you be more aggressive, less aggressive? Right. That that comes down to where are you going to see the most incrementality? Is that going to be from your uh, the newer products that you're uh, that you're launching? Um, how much market share do you believe that you can uh, you can expand on with with some of your um, some of your best selling products, um, and then ultimately, do you have a tool or do you have a process in place that allows you to 
make these kinds of calculations, make these kinds of decisions uh, in a way that keeps up with the ever-changing market for every single product that you sell. So as Andrew mentioned, I, as the head of sales engineering at Takeometrics, uh, a lot of what I do is analyzing the current uh, structure and the current ecosystem that brands have before working with Takeometrics. And so we've compiled a couple of different examples of ways that certain brands that we've seen uh, miss the mark or, or some uh, in some way are uh, are not fully optimized. So this is this is a really common one. Um, my competition is really intense. Uh, if I win more impressions, uh, I'll win more sales and effectively choke out my my competition until uh, until I've uh, gained my uh, maximum target share or market share, uh, and then uh, and then I can I can relax. So I'm okay operating. Uh, at a, uh, a really low ROAS for uh, for a indeterminate period of time, if it means um, blowing my competition out of the water. So the questions that we usually ask in in response is, you know, what's the relative incremental value I can drive in terms of sales if I win this impression? And that's that's an important qualification is that if you do win the impression, right, which you might be, um, how much additional value can you expect in return? And, and usually this is the point where we um, we talk about the diminishing point of returns, is that eventually you reach a bid and you reach a, a cost per click at a point where you're starting to eat into your profits and then you're the one that's, that's getting negatively impacted by this. Um, so another way of thinking about that is, What's the opportunity cost that I'm losing if I don't win the impression? How many how many sales would I expect to lose if I don't win every single impression? This is a really good example. So when you're thinking about playing brand defense, um, you want to keep this concept of product diversity above the fold in mind. Um, so if I type in, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Coffee Espresso uh, into the Amazon search bar, uh, these are the results that I get. And you can see the same kinds of products appear over and over again. So just above the fold that Mr. Coffee Espresso and Cappuccino Maker, uh, Cafe Barista Silver, that product appears three times uh, in the first couple of results. The, uh, the one touch appears three times as well. Um, and what you're effectively doing is just spreading out the possibility that a consumer will click on, uh, on an ad instead of the organic result uh, and ultimately driving up cost. So when we're talking about brand defense, it is important to make sure that you're, uh, that you're targeting your own brand, but keep in mind how incremental is is this keyword how how can i drive the most incrementality uh, across my uh, across my catalog and this is a great opportunity to introduce some of uh, the middle of your catalog or the the lower end of your catalog and especially things like brand new products if you've already established uh, a good brand presence on amazon uh, this is a way to say hey you might be familiar with our product that already has the Amazon choice or already has the, the bestseller uh, tag, here's a different product. So even if you're not driving a sale through that, uh, through that ad, you're making sure that if the consumer is interested in your bestseller, that you're not paying for that sale unnecessarily. So here's here's another uh, here's another one that we hear pretty often. I group my campaigns with differently priced products so I can appeal to different audiences. Um, so the the thought being, um, I don't want to pigeonhole 
certain consumers into, into buying one product versus the other, I'll let Amazon decide what's the best product to, uh, to serve um, for a given keyword. Uh, and all of the products that I have in that ad group uh, would be some level of relevant anyway. And really what you want to think about is, right, again, for, for every keyword, there's, there's a right amount to bid. And if you're getting different levels of revenue across different products, not only is, is that going to affect the types of sales that you're, that you're going to get, um, but products with different prices inherently have different conversion rates. And so now you've introduced two variables into your equation for calculating the, the proper bid that are going to confound the results. So if you're looking at things like conversion rate, for a given keyword, or if you're looking at ROAS for a given keyword, uh, you, because you've mixed these products together, the results that you're gonna get aren't going to be conclusive because of that mix. So one, one way to think about it is, if I'm overbidding or underbidding, how can I adjust without damaging another product's growth? So by creating that structure, by establishing that foundation, uh, of branded targets, generic targets, or category targets, and competitor targets for all of the products distinctly, you're able to create those levers that you can pull or push or, uh, or dials that you can adjust up or down given the results for those, uh, for those keywords and campaigns. So this is a, a typical structure that we use at Take a Metrics for, uh, for our customers. So for every single product, um, you can think about three, uh, three larger buckets, the category campaigns, branding campaigns, competitor campaigns. Uh, and within the category campaigns, you can break that down into ad groups or, or create additional campaigns um, based off of whether or not keywords have uh, or whether or not those products appear high for, for an organic result, whether it's low and you want to, uh, you want to boost that. Um, is it uh, a product attribute targeting uh, ad group where you're targeting a, uh, a category and maybe you have the price bands uh, built into that as well. Um, and then your automatic campaigns, which are sourcing uh, new ways that consumers are interacting with your products. Branded campaigns you could break down into uh, into any of the keywords that might be relevant uh, for your brand. Uh, ASIN defense, right, in the same way that you want to play offense on targeting your competitors by ASIN, you also want to do that for your own uh, for your own campaign, so that way you can explicitly establish that uh, that value that bid to Amazon <clears throat> instead of uh, instead of Amazon dictating what that bid should be through uh, through an auto campaign, uh, and then uh, sponsored display campaigns with ASINs so is a great way to to do uh, upsells or cross sells across your catalog, uh, and then the different targeting methods for competitor campaigns would be through keywords uh, and also through product attribute targeting uh, on those uh, explicit ASINs. And that way you can get as granular as possible when talking about driving uh, incremental sales uh, on your products. Yeah, so kind of just building, Kyle, on what you were just talking about. This is actually a study, uh, the data science team here, uh, specifically Eric, uh, Eric Cooper, on that team uh, conducted, this is uh, just last month, and he looked at multiple years worth of data uh, in terms of campaign performance. And what was super interesting here is just the difference between what he looked at, and this is a direct quote from the report, is a search term that is producing conversions within an automatic campaign for a given product stands to drive even higher conversion rates once it has moved as a keyword to that dedicated manual campaign for that same product. So basically, you're giving yourself, when you, when you see traction, when it comes to an, an auto campaign that is driving a, a significant number of conversions, 
uh, you're, you're seeing that volume there. Moving it to a manual campaign, kind of just like Kyle talked about within this uh, kind of one-to-many framework, it gives you a much higher floor and a higher ceiling in terms of conversion. Um, so right, you can see expected conversion rates higher. You see those, again, you see those dots which represent a conversion rate. Um, this actually related to price as well. So I encourage you to take out the, uh, take a look at the study since it's got some really cool insights even outside of this. But that right, you just raise the the potential floor and really, especially the potential ceiling, really of your of your potential conversion rate. So uh, definitely consider this. It, it just is a general best practice in terms of just really uh, making hay while the sun shines for what for what it's worth. Uh, in terms of if you're seeing that conversion volume, move that keyword to a manual campaign. You're more able to granularly bid against it. As, as 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 Kyle mentioned, and you just generally we're seeing better results in that in that construct. Yeah, the way I always think about it is if somebody brought a uh, a mystery box to uh, to my door and said, "How much are you willing to to pay for the contents of this box?" I wouldn't feel comfortable establishing a value until I saw the actual contents of that box, um, and then you can pick out the individual components. Uh, of all of those different keywords that were previously being targeted with an auto campaign and then say, okay, this one is a is a high performer. I'm going to bid that one up. This one uh, has, a, has a significantly lower conversion rate, it's still valuable to target it, but that way I can, uh, I can save some of my ad spend and then reinvest it back into the, into the higher performing terms. So how do we uh, how do we establish that foundation, right? Fundamentals matter. Um, this this campaign structure that we've uh, that we've established, that's going to be the lifting point for uh, for all of the decisions that you make from there. Um, so you know we talked about the difference between uh, high organic rank and low organic rank. Maybe you want to create a, a tier in the middle there. Um, maybe you have uh, different uh, ways to break down. Uh, targeting your own ASINs, uh, right? Depending on the the category that you're in, um, the next part is going to be around calculating your maximum allowable ad cost of sale for all of your products, right? Depending on the margin, depending on uh, how much you're uh, spending on the cost of goods sold for each of those products, that's going to be different across your your entire catalog. Uh, and so you need to be in a in a place to be able to change your bids depending on on that information. Uh, and then finally, how do you make these types of calculations and decisions on uh, on an ongoing and iterative basis? So do you have the tools to make these adjustments quickly as market conditions change? So when you're coming into your seasonal period, when should you be increasing your your bids <clears throat> um you know you don't want to do it too early because you might be overspending you don't want to do it too late because then you might be uh missing out on on potential sales so how do you create a, a process or do you have a tool that allows you to make those decisions so how do you calculate your maximum ACOS target. So your base max target is going to be the average pre-ad gross margin uh, of those products in, in, a, in a given ad group. So if a product costs $10 uh, and, it co and your um, cost of goods sold, your pick and pack fees, all of the, uh, all of the fees that are associated with um, getting that product to uh, to Amazon's warehouse, if you take all of that into account, how much margin are you left over with? And if all of that is $8, then your pre-ad gross margin is 20%, and therefore that should be your base max target. Uh, there are two modifiers that we've kind of hinted at over this uh, entire presentation. The first one is goal modifiers. Right, so depending on where the product is in its life cycle, you might have um, different modifiers that you want to use. So, for example, in the launch phase, we would recommend 
uh, modifying your max target by 200% or, or doubling that um, that pre-ad gross margin. Um, so that's going to mean operating uh, in the red for that launch period, but it means that you're growing that product to uh, to a point where eventually you're going to reach profitability. Um, for growth, that means about 150%, uh, and then profit should be uh, around 90% of your of your base max target, uh, and that's where we've seen the best um, balance between continuing to operate uh, efficiently in terms of driving a lot of sales, but also uh, maximizing the uh, the amount of profit that you see. Uh, the audience modifiers is is another multiplier that you're going to use on that max target, depending on those different targeting types. So for brand, you know the conversion rate's going to be higher, and you know the incremental value of that target is going to be lower. We usually operate uh, at around 50% of that base max target for branded targets. Um, competitor, that's going to have the most incremental value, um, but is also going to have the lowest conversion rate. So in order to uh, compensate for that, we need a higher uh, max target than what the uh, pre-ad gross margin is at. And then category is your, uh, that's your base, that's your home. So that should be, uh, there should be no modifier applied there other than what the goal modifier is. Yeah, and just to, just to add on here, you know, these are kind of guidelines we use, uh, but right, they're not, they're not gospel, right? We're, you know, for each of your, you know, respective business that we'll work with, right, we'll look at these modifiers and, and use these as guideposts, but, but kind of scale based on what is that advertiser's goals? You know, what's the competitive landscape like, right? To, to kind of adjust these based on those factors. But this is kind of, it's a good starting point as you kind of think about this. That's a great distinction to make. Thank you, Andrew. So after you've established your max target, what do you, uh, how do you, how do you unpack that? Like what's, what's going to go into that, uh, into that decision? So, um, where it's, what's your product current life cycle? Do you need to, uh, if it's in the launch phase, um, how, how long are you willing to, um, to keep that in the launch phase, uh, right? So it's important to create these goalposts or milestones for these products so that you know ahead of time, okay, when we're, when we're seeing X number of sales per day, on this item, uh, then we're ready to move it to the next stage. And that way you're planning on this ahead of time uh, instead of making these de decisions on the fly. Um, <clears throat> what's your profitability tar uh, tolerance for different situations? Uh, are there going to be certain competitors who, uh, who appear more often in those sponsored products placements and therefore, do you need to compensate with, with higher uh, ACOS targets, or um, are you willing to, uh, to operate at that, um, at that higher level if it means balancing out because of the, uh, of the volume that you see from a given competitor? Uh, where is your product ranking organically um, across the relevant search terms? Um, do you have the bestseller uh, tag? Do you have the Amazon choice tag? Um, those are, are different factors that you need to take into account um, when establishing goals for, for these products. <clears throat> uh, and something that goes a little bit outside of, of the advertising realm, which is what's your product price compared to the market, right? There might be different uh, audiences for your category, depending on the type of product that they look at. Um, so who are your uh, main competitors? What are their products? Uh, are you offering something at a competitive price for similar features? Uh, those types of things will ultimately affect um, the conversion rates that you're seeing from your ads. Same goes for things like uh, enhanced brand content on uh, on your product detail page do you have a rich product experience for for consumers to to look at uh, when they reach your product detail pages are you giving them lifestyle images do you have videos 
those types of things are, are also uh, important when, um, when thinking about what your goals are on the advertising side. So like I mentioned before, you know, you can set up these campaigns, you can have the best structure, uh, but ultimately um, if you're not looking at the results in the right way, um, you're not gonna be able to, uh, to evolve and be able to, uh, to iterate on that, on that structure. So one thing to consider is the, uh, the rate of, or sorry, the, the change in conversion rate. So you might have a, uh, oh, here, here's an example. If you have a 20% conversion rate over the last 30 days, what is the conversion rate that you can expect over the next 30? Uh, should it be 20%? Maybe. Um, the, the point is that there are more complicated um, <clears throat> mathematical considerations that need to go into account in order to predict the future conversion rate because just because the conversion rate over the last 30 days is 20 percent doesn't mean it's going to be 20 percent of the next 30 days and so that's what the take metrics algorithm excels at which is being able to uh to look at the conversion rate in a uh in a decaying fashion uh you know weighing more towards uh, more recent data, taking into account a lot more variables other than what the historical conversion rate will, uh, will be um, in order to predict what it will be in the future. Um, so volume needs to be taken into account, right? Just because you have one click and one conversion doesn't mean that uh, you have a, uh, the perfect product and, and the future conversion rate's gonna be 100%. Um, you know, there are, these factors that need to be taken into account um, that can't be expressed in an Excel formula uh, or, um, or a calculator. Um, and just because you paid a certain CPC over one period of time doesn't mean that's going to continue. Um, so this is a, a common theme that we see, especially across branded targets, where you might have a bid of $5 and a CPC of $1 and therefore you might have a good ACOS and you might be okay with that, but you're putting yourself at risk for overbidding if a competitor comes in and all of a sudden starts bidding $3, now you're, now you're in a, a different situation. So um, that's why the, the bid that you're using should be tied to the value that you get, not the historical ACOS that you've seen for that given keyword, not the historical uh, performance that you've seen um, over the last, 30 or 60 days. So here's an example of one of the analyses that we do in our audits. So when we look at the different uh, keywords that a given brand is, uh, is targeting, how does their current bid compare to what this value per click should be? So taking into account the product price, uh, or the average order value, uh, the conversion rate that we're seeing for that uh, for that keyword, uh, and what their max target uh, would be. Again, given those different modifiers, um, here's here's a keyword for for long underwear men's where they're currently bidding a dollar fifty, they're paying a dollar twenty eight on average. But when we take into account these variables, they should actually be bidding three dollars and seventeen cents. And so they're underbidding and therefore not driving as many sales as they could be while maintaining that level of efficiency that they're comfortable with. All right, here's another example for, um, for flannel back tablecloth where they're bidding 65 cents, but they're paying 47 cents, right? So they're, uh, but when we take into account these variables, the average order value times the conversion rate times their A cost target, that actually comes out to 47 cents. And so what that means is that because their average CPC is 47 cents and the value per click is 47 cents, any impression that they've won or any click that they've driven where the, uh, the second bid was over 47 cents ended up 
cutting into their efficiency, cutting into their profit. And so you might have um, you might have the right CPC given the value, but you need to take into account um, all of the the different factors that you're uh, that you're measuring in order to drive the best value. So here are a couple of uh, of guidelines and takeaways that if you're um, you, you know if you're going to go back to your your desk or look at your current structure, what what else can you look at um, uh, pretty pretty immediately? So the conversion rates are going to be uh, an early indicator that an ad is working or not. So this is something that we take into account when we're looking at the performance of a keyword through an auto campaign. Right? That's going to guide us for when we add it to a manual campaign. Is this something that is going to be uh, be profitable? Is this something that we need to be more cautious of? Right. So the ACOS can fluctuate from day to day. ACOS also depends on the um, the second bids for those prices. So ACOS is usually a, a trailing indicator if um, if an ad is working or not. Uh, conversion rates are uh, are going to be your best uh, guide there. So make sure you're you're absolutely looking at uh, not just the uh, not just your bids, but how does the conversion rate play into that bid? Um, playing smart defense on your own branded terms. You know that's not to say that you should be not bidding on them at all. Right? There's a right price for every uh, keyword. Um, so this is a great opportunity to highlight different products that might not be appearing in the, in the top of, uh, of search placements for your own brand. How do you introduce those new products? How do you create above the fold diversity? Um, and for newer brands or products, um, popular generic terms are really, really valuable. Right? That's, that's going to be high volume. Uh, right, and the and the faster that you can ramp up those products, um, the easier it's going to be to to maintain that uh, that status and that value. If you slowly ramp up your products, or if it's going um, uh, in and out of stock, uh, Amazon is is going to to be cautious and and be hesitant to um, to move those products up. So if you're able to create a lot of excitement with those products really quickly. The best way, the best avenue, will be through those um, popular generic terms, high-volume generic terms. Great, and I think that that takes us to Q and A. So that was that was a great, whole lot of uh, great information there. And I know we have a, a few questions uh, that that we can get to. I think one that just because you you're kind of hitting on it just now, so I think it's worth this is from Mike. Um, and very relevant in relation to new products, which uh, Mike, Mike asks, Amazon told me that for new products, I have to, quote, prime the pump by bidding high in order to overcome, quote, relevance issues. Have you heard the same? And how long do I have to do this? Uh, his example is right specifically on kind of a maxing out bids on branded campaigns last last couple months. CPCs are low, but not getting any impressions. I mean, I think on, on the latter point, and Kyle, I'm sure you can talk a little more about this, but on the latter point, in terms of driving volume, right, to really prime the pump and, and kind of show Amazon that your product is is one that they should show organically on, you know, on top terms, uh, we typically recommend for, for kind of as you're trying to get those new products seen and give them a, you know, not have to essentially bid super high for in perpetuity, right, is really focus on a small basket of key category terms, right, generic or category terms, that you feel right, they're relevant for your product, and you can focus on a few of those to, uh, again, get you know get those sales that you need that are going to be at a high enough volume, right? Where Amazon then in an algorithm says, oh, okay, customers that search for this type of product are converting on your product, even if it is new. That shows it is relevant, right? And that's going to pay dividends uh, from a relevance point of view. And again, by by doing it on a generic or category term, right? Those are just going to be generally higher volume because really. As you talked about earlier, right? Outside of uh, you know a few select brands in in, in each you know in, in a given category, most branded terms don't get nearly as much traffic 
uh, as as those category level terms. I don't know, Kyle, if you have anything else to add there. Yeah, I, I would say in addition to those popular um, keywords, don't forget about the uh, product attribute targeting capabilities. I'm really surprised with how many brands are using this this feature, especially you know household names who we we look at their structure, we look at how their uh, their Amazon search is set up, and they're missing one of the most valuable features uh, within AMS, which is the ability to target specific ASINs. So not only concentrating your spend in those high volume generic terms, but who are the big players? You know that that's going to be where uh, a lot of the clicks and uh, uh, and eyeballs are going to be on those um, on those highly uh, ranking organic products. So if you're able to pick out you know the top 15 or 20 that uh, that show up for for those generic search terms, you're going to be able to um, to give yourself other chances to uh, to win those impressions and and to drive more traffic to uh, to your pages, and you're doing so at potentially a lower cost just because not everyone is using this feature. I I, I don't know why it's it's a uh, it's one of my favorite features to to use, especially when you're thinking about launching new products, uh, and especially when you're thinking about um, the context of market share, right? So who who can you uh, target explicitly that you know a lot of consumers are already going to be looking at? Yeah, that's that's a great point. And, and kind of along along these lines, you see a question come through. And, and thank you for all the questions, everybody. Um, this is from David. Says, when do you know you've run out of steam on a term? And you know, his example is winning for weeks, and but now no new sales in the past 30 days, and, and with with still some multiple clicks. I mean, generally, you know, this is why we kind of recommend that automatic to manual campaign structure, so you can potentially surface new keywords that are relevant and driving volume, but then right, you can kind of uh, more granularly bid on them, even if right, it's something that maybe. You write something that, that has maybe fallen out of favor with consumers where they're searching for something else that's still relevant, you can maybe surface those. I, I don't know, Kyle, if you have anything kind of to build on here when you kind of yeah. see this returns. Yeah, that's that's a a really good question and and you're you're definitely thinking about it the right way. Um the the common misconception is that by increasing your bids, you're you're going to to just win more impressions and and ultimately win more sales. Um you can't create demand though. You can't force consumers to to search for your products in a given way. You can only react to that demand. And so, if you see that all of a sudden the the conversion rate for one of those keywords has dropped off or sales have dropped off, you need to react accordingly by adjusting the bid given these new conversion rates. Um, and and the other side of that is okay if you do see great conversion rate and all of a sudden that changes. Who are those sales going to? So it's it's a good way to uh, to do a little bit of competitor research um, and uh, again be able to to target those competitors uh, explicitly with uh, with attribute targeting uh, campaigns uh, and then understand why those uh, why those sales are are not going to your products anymore. Is it because that uh, a competitor is is running a promo on their product? Um, and and they're driving more sales, but um, definitely a, a great opportunity to um, uh, to be able to shift your your focus and shift your spend, given that that demand. And like what Andrew said, it's it's important to have maximal coverage, so that way when when you do see these these kinds of shifts, you're able to allocate budget back to uh, to where you see the best performance. Great. And we, I think we have time for a couple more questions here. Uh, quickly, uh, this is from Jason asking about uh, does Takeometrics allow us to uh, manually manage kind of keyword uh, from audit abroad and does it allow us to approve bid changes? So the answer is to both those questions is is yes, right? You can approve either uh, automatically or just at a manual pace, kind of moving keywords from automatic campaigns into manual campaigns, whether that's broad match, exact match, or otherwise. Uh, and right, you can also think about it from a from a bit change. You know, we will 
it's more about setting max and right thinking about uh, bit changes within within that that construct. Um, but it does give you, you know, what we do give you is a lot of manual control in terms of when to move keywords over, what your thresholds are, uh, and also based on within kind of the campaign creator that, that we have, right, uh, based on, let's say, product lifecycle uh, and the metrics that Kyle mentioned earlier, right, like how much if you're, let's say, trying to launch a product, right, uh, being more aggressive versus less aggressive uh, on those on those metrics. So do give you uh, a great deal of control there. Um, so just want to make sure I got to, because I know we have a ton of questions. This was a great question from Laura earlier. So this is around some of the, the search term data that we talked about, uh, and, and additionally some of the stuff we talked about around keyword type, which was, you know, in that graph, we saw toys and games comparatively had actually a high number of branded terms as compared to category terms in that top 10K. And, you know, would that lead to, let's say, a strategy where you want to be a little more offensive competitor-wise uh, in toys as compared to other categories? And, I mean, the answer is, is, is likely yes, right? I mean, you would see this even within uh, ARA or, or brand analytics reports that, okay, well, within my category, what are the terms that people are searching for most? And right in, in toys and games, right, it may be that people have, let's say, a brand affinity for, uh, you know, let's say Playmobil or Lego or, you know, these type of branded uh, toy terms that they're going after. And, in you know, as Kyle talked about, right, product product attribute targeting can, can help, help here. Um, but additionally, right, as you look across your, uh, your, your market, you need to know what are the dynamics there and how can you best address them? And in writing toys, it may be, hey, I need to go after my competitors harder because there's this affinity where people are just searching for the branded terms more often, um, or I need to find what are the category terms at high level that I should go after. Let's say like toys for six-year-olds, things like that that are always popular. Um, and I don't know, Kyle, about if you have anything to add here just generally. Um, this is something that we use the brand analytics tool a lot for, which is just because we see these patterns of, uh, you know, the percentages of, of keywords for, for different brands. But it's important to know, okay, if, if there are competitor brands who, uh, who have really high volumes, um, that you have a lot of keyword coverage there. And um, you can certainly seed that with, uh, with those broad, keywords and and uh and automatic campaigns it's important to know okay who who are the big players for those uh for those brands looking at those asins and being able to target them um uh target them directly uh so something that you should look at for uh for your brand is type in your your top competitors into the uh into the search terms tool uh and look at the search frequency for uh, for those terms. Um, and if it's really high, you you know what the opportunity can be uh, if you start targeting those keywords, if you start targeting those ASINs that have uh, a lot of the click and, and sale share there. Great, uh, thanks Kyle. I think that that's, that's really all the time we have. I know there's a ton of questions that we didn't get to. I encourage you, if, if you did have a question, Please uh, reach out uh, if you can. Obviously, feel free to shoot me an email directly. My name is Andrew Weber. I'm A W A B as in boy E R at takeametrics.com. Seriously, feel free to reach out to me directly with other questions you may have. Uh, additionally, as some people had asked about, we we did record this webinar, and everyone here will get uh, a recording of this webinar along with the full slide deck. And I'm also going to include some of the assets we talked about in here: the uh, data study around price and conversion rate along with the uh, incrementality uh, ebook so that you can kind of take a look at more in depth. So again, thank you all for, for hopping on the line here. I hope this was, was informative and hope to see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Thank Bye -bye. you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.